Hello everyone, welcome back to the Manic Manor podcast. This is Mitchie. So for today's episode, we're going to talk about the rooftop Koreans in the 1992 LA riots. So for anybody who isn't sure about the rooftop Koreans, they were a group of people who during the 92 riots were left to defend themselves when everything was just going haywire after um, the Rodney King verdict. So they had taken up arms to protect their homes and places of business when um, the police force in L.A. and the surrounding areas just could not do so. And so they've garnered quite a bit of popularity here recently among um, conservative groups and stuff with the right to bear arms and all the gun issues that have been going on here in the U.S. as of late and um, among history buffs as well, such as myself. So I started to do some research and looked into, you know, why they were targeted in particular with the riots and stuff. And it was quite interesting because it wasn't just, you know, the Rodney King verdict itself and just rioters rioting for the sake of, you know, vandalizing stuff because, you know, this Rodney King verdict was quite a big spark of what happened um, with the riots, but there was much more that happened. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to go into um, the actual rooftop Koreans and them defending their places of business, and then, you know, kind of the tensions going on between the Koreans and African American communities, um, not just in the U.S., but all over the world as well. So we shall go into it. Now, it's been 31 years since the 1992 LA riots that left billions of dollars worth of damage among not only residential areas but a lot of places of business and primarily um, from the research that I had done a lot of that happened to be Korean owned businesses and you'll see as we go further into talking why that was. Now there was an extreme tension between a lot of ethnic groups at the time particularly between the Asian and black communities. One um, major reason that I found was a case that involved a young teenage girl named Latasha Harlan. Latasha, she was a young teenage girl um, born January 1st, 1976, and she was just 15 years old when tragedy had struck her. Um, And this was a case that would make history and would be part of the 1992 LA riots that doesn't actually get spoken about as much from what I've seen because it tends to kind of get a little bit overshadowed by the Rodney King case, not saying that Rodney King's case isn't as important, but I feel like her case is just as important to be brought up. So, March 16th, 1991, Latasha had gone into a grocery store that was owned and ran by a Korean American woman named Soon Jadu. Uh, Latasha's grandmother had told her to um, get some orange juice earlier that day, so that's exactly what she had been doing. And so she had gone and picked up the orange juice, and according to sources, said that she had placed it in her bag and had grabbed money from her pocket and was going to go pay. However, the owner soon saw this and took it as Latasha was just going to steal the orange juice because she had put it in her backpack. So she confronted the girl for attempting to quote unquote steal it and an argument ensued even though Latasha had the money in her hand. Um, So as this argument was going on, um, Latasha was just turning to leave after which um, soon turned around, grabbed a .38 caliber gun and fired at Latasha from as Latasha was leaving, so Latasha was shot in the back, and it killed her instantly. So within the within a year of this happening, residents in the neighborhood would take to the streets, protesting and outrage, demanding justice. So when they did an investigation into this, um, authorities found that the gun that soon owned had been altered and the trigger was like more sensitive either to give soon a better chance at shooting people making it easier to fire something along that lines but the gun had been altered so it was um not like what the original gun was supposed to be now soon claimed that she never saw the money in latasha's hands but 
all in all, in my opinion, it doesn't justify you shooting somebody, let alone a 15-year-old child walking away from an argument. Now, they didn't mention if she put the orange juice back, but I can only assume that she was either going to or she just was walking away out of frustration. Later at Soon's trial, she was convicted of voluntary manslaughter, but only received about five years of probation and got a fine and about 400 hours worth of community service. And of course, the African American community was completely outraged because they saw that this was a complete overstep of justice and Latasha was not getting what she deserved out of this. She was not getting any kind of justice whatsoever. Nothing was properly served. A child lost her life. And this woman was essentially being able to walk away free with no jail time and essentially just a slap on the wrist. And essentially that is what happened because um, as of the 15th anniversary of the riots, um, Soon had been able to live peacefully in like the San Fernando Valley from what I had researched without anybody really knowing exactly where she had lived. So needless to say, um, this created a big divide in trust and any kind of formative relation between, you know, Korean American and African American communities in the Los Angeles County area or anywhere within that vicinity. So, not only that, but we I've also mentioned the Rodney King trial. Now, this happened before what happened to Latasha. This story happens on March 3rd, 1991. And we've got um video that has surfaced around for quite a while about this. Now, at 1245, in the early morning hours of March 3rd, a parolee named Rodney King had been stopped by the police after an eight-mile-long pursuit through the Los Angeles streets. King had been intoxicated at the time and was caught for speeding by a California patrol officer. However, King didn't pull over why or when he um, didn't pull over immediately we don't know but when he didn't um, other police decided that they were going to join in on this pursuit taking him like as a threat and when he finally did stop several officers swarmed the vehicle ordering king to exit now during this time king had two other people in the vehicle they stated and they were made to exit as well and lay on the ground Now, due to King possibly being intoxicated, he was a little bit slower to respond to the orders of the police, and this potentially angered the officers. As a result, um, officers Lawrence Powell, Timothy Wynn, Ted um, Brisno, and Roland Solano forced King out of the car and down onto the ground, and of course, King kind of resisted from this and was stunned twice. Now, the stun gun in question was noted to have had a charge of about 50,000 volts. So, with all of the commotion, King being knocked onto the ground, and after being stunned twice with the stun gun, and now he's being beaten, apparently, with, like, batons and fists and being kicked, um, uh, even with it being 12, 45, 1 o'clock in the morning, people are starting to notice because there's a lot of commotion, a lot of sound being made. So, a nearby civilian by the name of George Holliday, uh, he was on a balcony nearby and had a video camera with him. And this is where we find that infamous footage of Rodney King being beaten. This would become that infamous video that would last around 90 seconds. King rises after being tased. Um, It kind of looks like as he's running, there's an accusation that the officers threatened to kill him as well. Um, It's noted that because of the helicopters that were involved in this chase of the incident that the audio isn't clear whatsoever. So there's not much really known about what was really said. But King claims, um, he claimed actually I should say before he had died, that they swore that they would kill him and called him the N-word. So the entire video 
catches Powell beating King with a baton multiple times, as I said, while Brisno roughly steps on King's upper back and neck, and more can be seen um, during the duration of that 90-second video, as King is trying to shield himself from being, you know, hit as a protective measure before they finally handcuff him. In the end, um, George Holiday ends up taking the video and selling it to a local TV station that would later broadcast this footage and result in the outrage among, you know, the black community. And this outrage would lead to a trial of all the officers involved. And of course, these officers, because of the due process laws and everything that we've got in the United States, so they would get a fair trial. They move the trial from Los Angeles County to Ventry County. However, um, despite having video evidence of the officers beating him, despite um, the claims that King had, um, all the officers involved were found not guilty. All except for an assault charge against Officer Powell that ended up in a hung jury. So with that being a hung jury, he got off scot-free. And this is where we get the starting point for the 1992 LA riots. Now we see now the two major jumping off points that made the protesters so upset and angry feeling as though the legal system had completely failed them and was turning their back against them. There were many people um, who wanted to, you know, peacefully protest this and call forth attention to, you know, the um, police brutality and the racism and injustice that was going on in the country because there was a clear abuse of power that was going on. Granted, you know, Nobody should be driving intoxicated because that's a dangerous thing to do, endangering your own life as well as other people's lives. But the sheer force of it, people naturally were upset because there's, it just seemed like a complete abuse of power. But where you also have people who want to seek justice, you also have people who want to create chaos as well. And we could see that in the form of these protests. So when the verdict came out on April 29th, 1992, the police force predicted to a degree um, that the protest would happen, but they didn't know exactly how bad things could possibly get. So in turn, these protests would last about six days, so not even a week really, but less than a week's worth of protest would cause such an amount of damage and such an amount of loss that is so greatly unprecedented that it looked like something that you would see out of like a, the Purge films before the Purge was even an actual thing. It was like complete anarchy when you look at these, like the footage in the films that have circulated especially um, for anybody who was around in LA during that time how scary and horrifying it really was so the rebellion in LA for the 1992 LA riots had officially begun in the 4 p.m. hour the first um, issues began with a liquor store that was broken into Mobs essentially kind of breaking in there, just deciding that they were going to break in and just take whatever they wanted. So they were just stealing alcohol, smacking people in the face, punching them, um, doing whatever they wanted for the sake of saying that they were protesting. Um, trashing up the place before leaving. Um, and the owner of the store decided that they were going to call the police. But by the time the police had actually arrived, all of the culprits that had done any of the damage were long gone. So the police, of course, um, began a search of the nearby area. But now that these protests were underway, things were extremely tense and police did not have a good uh, rapport in their favor at this point. 
Um, the units weren't a happy sight in any of these neighborhoods. So, as the vehicles were going, you know, patrolling the areas up and down, there were some there were some kids, teenagers, young adults, throwing rocks, stones, whatever they could at the vehicles. One boy happened to hit one of the cruisers, and the police decided that they were going to do something about that, so they got out of their cruiser and decided that they were going to arrest this guy. And, of course, that just created more public unrest, and so it was like a swarm of locusts coming down on the authorities, telling them to leave this guy alone, so... It got so bad that eventually the police just had to evacuate that area. And before they knew it, within a few hours, it was like a humongous, like, plague virus just engulfing Los Angeles. Just stores being looted, people are being beaten, people are being ripped out of their cars. Something that started from... A simple protest against um, these, like, four policemen that have been beating on this man to now an entire city is being set on fire and civilians just passing by on the street trying to, like, deliver stuff are being ripped from their cars because everything's completely out of control. I mean, at one point, um, news anchors were doing coverage of these protests. There was, um, I think there was an immigrant on one thing that I saw, like a coverage that I was looking at named Choi C. Choi, um, and a trucker named Reginald Denny. They were being brutally attacked and pulled from their trucks as they were trying to work. It was so crazy. And things on the front for the law enforcement... They they were saying they were so overwhelmed that eventually the police chief made this decision that they just were only going to listen to the complaints that were coming in, but they weren't going to do anything about them. So everybody that essentially wasn't wealthy or affluent was kind of on their own. Now, 1992... I think Elizabeth Taylor had a wedding that she was doing or something like that. And at one point, there was like a police uh, chopper that was like flying over that kind of got a little bit of a view of her walking down and having her wedding done. So you got to see how detached from reality like celebrities were at this point. Meanwhile, the majority of, you know, Hollywood and everything was literally on fire. So it was freaking crazy but you know that just shows even now how detached everything really is but violence was still spreading so by the following morning around 12 15 a.m the mayor had signed a curfew for the area from dusk until dawn hoping to curtail that action so los angeles city was now finally under a state of emergency However, the violence was still spreading from city to city like a virus. So, the media was trying to label, you know, all of these protesters as lawless criminals, gang members, thugs, you name it. Which, I mean, you can't really, you can't really do that. It's, even with everybody that was going on there just doing chaos to create chaos. There was still people out there trying to prove a point that there were people in positions of power abusing their power. But it was getting lost within the context of people that were just wanting to run around and of course, you know, just set things ablaze. But, you know, even now even now that's like that and you can't just loop th- loop everything into one category. That's just not how thi- that's not how things sh- work. But I digress. Now, here's where we get into talking about the rooftop Koreans. 
Eventually, all this violence was spreading, and as I said, it would spread from town to town, city to city. Now, it would go up and eventually find its way into Koreatown. Now, with the previously strained relationship on the Korean-African-American relations, Koreatown was in for taking a major hit. Korean-Americans, um, they were, they referred to this day as Saigu, literally translating into 249 as in April 29th. Well, understandably, people would be hurt at injustice. These are, or these were Koreans who had come from South Korea, a nation which just itself had come from a dictatorship under the leadership of Chun Doo Hwan. Um, lots of these Koreans were had Korean men who had probably seen some form of military training to a degree because Korea, even back then, still had the mandatory service that you would have to serve. You know, I don't know if it was still the two-year kind of uh, mandatory service that they do now or if it was longer that they would have to serve. But they had seen dictatorship. They had seen so many struggles and a lot of Things like the June struggle and, you know, um, the Kwanju massacre and uprising. So they're no stranger to riots. And not only that, uh, some of these people had been defectors from North Korea as well. So they had seen their fair share of shit. And so either coming from North Korea, defecting into South Korea, and then coming to the United States, or just being from South Korea during a time when they were experiencing so much unrest and reformation before coming to the U.S. themselves to try to start a better life. They were no strangers to this kind of unrest and riot, so it was nothing new. These were people who just wanted to start new lives, build something new for their families, and they weren't about to just let that be taken away from them like any other person who just wanted to defend their livelihood and their property. Now, the riots and the looting came to these biz businesses, and many of the Korean immigrants were quick to defend these livelihoods and immediately did so with guns drawn. Uh, Richard Park is one that immediately comes to mind and name because he was one at the very forefront. Um, he's widely known because he had informed one of his co-workers or one of his workers, um, I could only find his name as David, that in the midst of everything going on, he was in a gunfight with a lot of uh, looters. And so his co-worker decided that he was going to come and help him. Now, when David and Richard had successfully fought off these looters, word started to spread amongst all the people in Koreatown that this was something that worked and worked very well. So, Koreatown started to huddle together to keep one another safe. Um, they ended up creating their own little va vigilante um, police station uh, of, out of one of the local Korean radio stations named Radio Korea, where they would take, you know, distress calls. Um, they would listen to other people talk about where they would see uh, potential looters or potential rioters coming in to give other people heads up because they had figured out quite quickly that the local authorities had essentially told them to just fuck off. We're not going to help you. So their mindset was if the authorities are not going to help us, we are going to help each other. So they became their own help. And... From there, we see iconic images of the roof Koreans. Um, you know, like the images we see of the Koreans quite literally sitting on top of the roofs of their businesses with the white bandanas tied around their heads with guns in their hands, like the Daewoo rifles and everything, like the iconic images. Um, former Korean Marine veterans, they would gather with their families and friends um, who had all come to America for their new starts to defend what they had worked so hard for. They armed themselves, took to these roofs, firing off warning shots into the air or from various points 
to where they had, you know, quite literally the high ground to see and scope the area to defend everything. Um, through these methods that they did, they were able to actually successfully kind of defend quite a few of their businesses. Now, of course, a lot of these businesses did suffer quite a lot of catastrophic um, um, detriments. Um, but by the sixth day, they were able to, you know, scavenge what they uh, scavenge what they could. And when the smoke did start to kind of rise and clear, the National Guard was finally coming in. Now, about 45% of the damage that was done to um, all the businesses and everything was Korean-owned businesses in the riots. Over 2,300 Korean-owned businesses had either been looted or burned. And the totals and damages across the board ended up being about a billion in overall damages as well as, you know, about 2,300 people had been injured in the events, with 63 people in total losing their lives, including an 18-year-old named Edward J. Song Lee, um, who had been killed while trying to protect his neighborhood, and later it was discovered that he had been killed um, because he was shot by mistake by another Korean-American in crossfire. Um, now that it has been 31 years from the date of these riots since Saigu, um, people who lived there during that time, like James Ahn, they remember how terrifying it really was and how they felt so abandoned and insignificant during that time. He remembers hearing people on the phone pleading with, you know, just pleading for the police to come help them and seeing his father tell him as like a 12-year-old boy to protect his family at all costs while he himself was so terrified and scared for like his mother who was, you know, a Korean because he didn't want her to be a target simply because she was a Korean woman and he didn't want her to be beaten by one of these negative rioters at the time because she wasn't one of those people who caused all this hardship. She just happened to be a Korean woman. Now, while there's still a lot of fissures and strains between, you know, the Asian and African communities, um, people like An are still hopeful that things are and will improve with time. Um, he hopes that people are going to become more cognizant of their ways and that they will hopefully come to the real realization that skin color is just a skin color and people are people. Now, even in the short days after the riots and for things like Edward Lee's death, People in Koreatown were pretty quick to assemble, you know, marches for peace, trying to reunify what they could. Um, but, you know, many of these businesses that were in Koreatown, either they were underinsured or they had literally nothing. They were uninsured businesses. So a lot of these um, things were completely tarnished and they couldn't reopen. They were never able to. What people could rebuild, they did. A lot of people had to start from scratch all over again. And that is absolutely devastating when you try to build something from the ground up, especially coming to a new world from something completely different and just trying to learn something completely new. Um, um, so what some people will simply see as the L.A. riots is really more than just that. Um, as I said, it's Saigu. It's an awakening for anyone in a minority status. It can show and does show the flaws in inadequate law enforcement protection. It shows the flaws of abuse of power. 
It shows that we all have parts of ourselves that we need and have to work on, as well as parts of us that we need to work on to unite together as one to fix a greater problem that's within all of us, something that is broken, something that we can fix if we are willing to try, and that we have to depend on ourselves when others are going to fail us. Now, years after the riots, um, a novel was written by an by actor and now author John Cho. Um, it was co-written with Sarah Sook, and it was called Troublemaker. It depicts a Korean American boy named Jordan who encounters um, a lot of incidents during the inf- infamous night of April 29th, 1992. And the book came out actually just last year. Um, now, of course, John Cho is known for doing a lot of comedies like Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. But he aimed for a more serious approach doing this coming-of-age story. Now, I've not read it yet, but I do um, hope to pick up this book sometime soon and give it a read. I hear that um, it's gotten a few good reviews, so I do want to give it a go and see if it's really good. Um, I've heard that this story doesn't overlook the murder of Latasha Harlins, of course, because she was killed by a Korean-American store owner a year prior to the events of the riots, so I do applaud John for not overlooking something that a lot of times, um, a lot of, um, criticism and, um, you know, Korean-American and Korean, um, livelihood get for overlooking certain aspects of things so I do applaud him for that but that is the story of the rooftop Koreans and how they had a major insight onto the LA riots so I want to thank you guys for listening in on this story if you have any other comments or anything you would like to input for this story if there's anything that I missed out on feel free to let me know Um, You can email me at manicmanorpodcast at gmail.com. You can also let me know on Facebook or Instagram at manicmanorpodcast. Of course, I will have this up on YouTube as well, and you can let me know in the comments too. If you feel so inclined, you can um, join on Patreon at patreon.com slash manicmanorpodcast, where um, I've only got it set up for like $5 a month, but it's not necessary if you don't want to, because I'm still going to pursue making more content. But if you have any other recommendations for cases or anything that you would like for me to cover, please let me know. And until next time, I'll see you guys later. Have a good day.